Hello students, my name is Gaurav Bansal and I teach economics here at GS Corp, an institution which we also know as IAS Corp because of our website. Now, we are here today to discuss the economic survey and to start the discussion on economic survey, first of all we want to talk about certain terms. Now when we consider the terminology in the survey, there are certain economic terms that you need to know in order to understand the survey really well, in order to read it smoothly. These are the common terms but used very frequently in the survey. So for example, the fiscal deficit, for example, accommodative monetary policy, expansionary fiscal policy, quantitative easing, these are the kind of terms, okay, these are not very unique terms. These are certain terms which are used in newspapers also regularly and used by people who are in the profession of economics and you need to understand them to understand the subject of economics or also to follow the survey properly. Now apart from these common terms which survey requires or which you require actually not survey it is you who require to understand these terms in order to read survey properly. There are certain other terms which survey itself has introduced over time. Okay, there are some unique and special terms which are into usage because of our economic survey. Otherwise, they would not have been in usage. Either they were used somewhere in certain context, but economic survey has mainstreamized it. Or survey has introduced the term itself. So, for example, Chakravyu challenge. This is a term created by survey itself. Okay. Now, let us look at such terms one by one. I have not only taken such terms from this survey only, but some of our previous surveys as well. Okay, By some I mean two to three surveys and it is because these terms still remain relevant, still remain impo remains important because those issues are still very much alive. And these terms are still being used because the old terms that have been introduced in survey are now getting used freely even in the new surveys. So, that is the point. Let us start with the term that you must have read by now, okay, barbell strategy, given in the very first chapter of this year's economic survey. So what is a barbell strategy? Now economic survey has used it in a certain context but before that let us understand the meaning and then I will explain in what context Indian government is using this term. So, barbell strategy is used in financial markets. A barbell strategy is a strategy where there is too much uncertainty and because of too much uncertainty where we do not know what will happen, either we invest in short term okay, either we invest in short term immediate because we do not know exactly what is going to happen. So, either we know that I am alive today, this is there today and maybe tomorrow I am not ready to take risk beyond that. So either we invest in very short term or we invest in very long term because we believe whatever is the crisis, whatever is uncertainty after 3-4 years, 5 years that ultimately it will end at certain point. So I am ready to invest after, I am ready to take a risk of beyond the 5 years, I am ready to take a risk of this one month, week. But I am not ready to take a risk of what will happen 6 months later, what will happen 1 year later. This is the risky period because right now there is uncertainty, we do not know what is what will happen tomorrow. Lot of things are happening, lot of instability is there. So when such situation is there in financial market, then making a portfolio, making a choice of investment where you either invest in very short term or in very long term, that is called a barbell strategy. Now, I do not exactly understand from where barbell as such has come into picture but barbell those who exercise definitely would know. So this is what a barbell looks like. Okay. So weight lifters lift the weights using the barbells. So this is a barbell. Okay, You have weights on the both side. In between there is road and then Okay, weightlifters lift 
clean and jerk and other otherwise also not just weightlifters bodybuilders so once there is a dumbbell which is also shaped like this but dumbbell is short barbell is long five six feet long road so you pick up anyways the point is not to why it is barbell because either your investment are very short term okay for example you I am here either all my investments are maturing in this period or they are maturing after a very long period there is nothing in between in between there is nothing that means nothing intermediate that is where the term the shape the everything has come into picture now why barbell in case of India so India has claimed its approach to the COVID as a barbell strategy barbell means either we are looking at the immediate situation that what is happening right now what is what we are delivering tomorrow to the public okay so the safety net system and then we are also looking at what will happen beyond this recovery so we do not know what will happen in this one or two years but the long-term programs are still on we are building our infrastructure we are building all those long-term projects but we are not that much focusing on the intermediate terms Okay, so the way we have defined our barbell strategy, it is a mix of a safety net. Okay, so we are providing a safety net, significant safety net to everyone. Plus we are following a certain agile approach. Okay, agile approach to our development. What is agile approach? I will explain because this is used as a separate term. But I hope you have understood what is barbell. The shape of barbell I have explained here. The short term then flat line nothing in between then again a balloon so either in the short term or in the long term nothing in between that is the barbell strategy I hope it is clear to you The next term is waterfall framework. Now waterfall framework is an alternate to the agile or in fact agile is an alternate to the waterfall. Waterfall is our standard traditional model of policy making or system of policy making. So we call it conventional policy making framework or conventional system. So this is our conventional policy making system. Now again its shape matters a lot here. What is waterfall? How does it? Okay so for example this is a waterfall. I'm not really good at drawing, but still, let us say this is a waterfall. In the waterfall framework, first of all, we know the problem, we know the origin. Okay, this is origin or the issue, or we can call it problem, whatever. Okay, so this is our origin then we also know that there are various possible path either we can take this path we can take this path we can take this path so we know that there are different approaches to solve this problem or different routes from here now the choice is between the routes or a mix of the route but we know the route we know it will follow this trajectory so in the waterfall framework we somehow assume that we know the problem we know the situation and detailed assessment of problem is possible okay and we have all information about the problem okay we know the problem we know all the information about it and we can do a detailed assessment and we can take a certain path so knowledge of problem
all information of problem, issue, problem, whatever you want to call it. Okay, we know what is problem, we know all information on the problem. Okay, we can with certainty in a way take a path. Okay, so we know certain paths. We know or we can determine certain path or solution out of problem. So we have knowledge of problem, we have all information on problem and we can determine a certain path or solution. So for example, this is a path, this is a path. So there are various possible routes coming out of it. And once we follow a path, then we are expected to follow a certain fixed trajectory. Okay, we need to choose the path or mix of path. But we know what route it will follow. Okay, so. I know the problem, I know all information about problem, I know these solution exist or these potential solutions are there. Now what I have to do, my choice is I have to choose a path out of them or I have to choose a mix of path out of them. But once I take a path, I know the clear trajectory that this is the route I am going to follow and that is why it is called waterfall because we once we know that from here water is falling. From our knowledge of physics, we can make assessment clearly where, at what speed, which angle water is going to fall. So that is something that we follow for our traditional approach. Okay, so this is our traditional system. That our dilemma is usually the policy choices. Usually we know that we have a poverty problem. Usually we know that this poverty problem can be addressed by various approaches. Okay, there is a capability approach, there is an income approach, there are different approaches. We can follow a certain approach, we can then we know if we follow certain approach, what we need to do, this will be the course of trajectory. It may not exactly be absolute certain, but still we know by and large what will be the path followed. So this is our traditional framework. However, COVID has created a kind of uncertainty, we do not know anything, it is an emerging situation. We cannot create such a path, we cannot create such policy options. So waterfall framework is our traditional, is our conventional policy making framework. It should be clear now, okay. So a waterfall framework should have these following features. Now instead of waterfall framework, we are forced to adopt the agile approach. Now I come to the next. So next is agile approach. And in fact, here you can see the list of the terms I am going to cover. Okay, not too many of them, around 5-6 about the ongoing issues about the COVID and the this year survey and the last year survey. And then some of the problems regarding the markets, the competition and some of the other issues, the nature of business cycle, etc. that we will discuss. And that is from the previous two surveys. So, that is my approach here. What is agile approach? The definition that economic survey has given to us, let me read it out. Agile is based on constant feedback loop and nothing is known about the path in advance. Okay, So constant feedback loop.
and nothing is known about the path. What is the meaning? We cannot make long term plans. Okay, so we cannot make a certain response then we have to be very flexible data is getting collected constantly and on the basis of that data we are going to react very quickly okay so there is constant data collection and we have to react to that data collection. So emerging situation also we can write. In the agile approach we cannot make a certain response okay. long term is not even perfectly accurate let's make it certain that would be better we cannot make a certain response okay. we cannot make a certain response we have to be very very flexible in our approach and we need to react to the emerging situation Okay, that is why we cannot create a certain response. Now, how do we react to the emerging situation? How do we know what is the emerging situation? For this, we need to follow, follow the high frequency parameters. So, what is the point? Here you can note down, I believe you have your notebook and your pen with you. In case it, you do not have, it would be better because there could be some points which will be useful for you. Still, if you do not want to write, it's up to you. But see, the idea is we cannot wait for data collection. We cannot wait for economic survey to come out. We cannot wait for one year. We cannot wait for six months. We cannot wait for quarterly monetary policy. We cannot wait for our conventional data system. Okay, because that would make our response very, very slow. We need to absolutely on the move permanently and on every. Moment. So we need to follow certain high frequency parameters. What are these high frequency parameters? Economic survey has given us certain high frequency parameters. So, for example, we should follow the economic activity not by our traditional data collection system, but we can also follow it how much toll collection is there through cargo trucks. So, if cargo, if goods are moving on the routes, this is an indicator of business as well. Not a perfect indicator, but still a good indicator. But the good thing about it, every day we can have data. Every day we can have data from our tolls. How many cars are passing through the tolls? How much traffic is there on the roads through satellite, through tolls? We can monitor that. Okay, so we need to look at the alternate indicator, high frequency indicator, which can be collected on daily basis, weekly basis. So GST collection, not the absolute collection about which we are informed in the budgets. You can look at the daily GST collection, okay, which is logged in by the businesses. Every day, how many businesses are filing it? because it is also electronic okay there may be some discrepancies some business may delay it but still we get a rough idea if on average every day there are 14 lakh filings and it suddenly falls to 9 lakh then we know that something is wrong here okay so that is something we can identify from GST collection then the power consumption if electricity consumption is still very high by industrial units that means industrial units are working so whether work is going on or not, whether products are being transported or not, we can follow that through certain indicators. And because of this ability, 
we get constant information and this creates a loop the constant feedback loop we get the information yes business is okay okay keep this keep this keep this on keep this on as soon as we get information no now things look bad from last two days cargo is going down last two days electricity is consumption is going down okay that means things are coming to halt now people are scared now things are stopping what we need to do in this situation so this is the kind of feedback i'm trying to portray as if i am looking into the situation so in that sense i am doing it so that is the constant feedback loop that is generated from the high frequency parameters okay so that is how we are able to follow a certain agile approach and in the very high uncertainty created by the covid we cannot follow our, our conventional waterfall approach because that requires information and that requires information to a such an extent that we have a certain path and we can follow it we know what to do what not to do so that possibility is not there so this is our agile framework agile framework is used in project management mining etc the next term is taper tantrum taper tantrum quite straightforward and easy to understand see taper taper means slanted okay this is this is not taper this is not taper usually this is what is we call taper okay slanted lines is called tapered line in economics or in finance by tapering we mean what is tapering first of all tapering is simply understood as a term where government is increasing interest rates this is what we typically understand as tapering tapering is a old term that we some sometimes use in finance so for example let us say our interest rate or bond yield is following this trajectory let us say the bond yield was 3% and it has come down to 1.75% okay so let us say bond yield has fallen constantly then it is stable around 1.75% then once again it starts to increase so this is called tapering so what is tapering tapering is a situation where a government gradually reverses its previous decision on the quantitative easing i know it may sound very technical at present but let me explain it so when government reverses its previous policy of quantitative easing quantitative easing is increase in money supply quantitative quant by quant we means the quantity of money supply in the economy easing means we have eased it we have easily allowed it money is easily available try to understand in that sense so quantitative easing when money supply increases why government introduce quantitative easing when we increase the money supply then because of more money supply in the system banks are pushed to create more loans bank create more loans and this also decreases interest rate because banks have to offer more money at a lower interest rate then only this much money can be allowed so this quantitative easing is done 
to ease of the interest rate, to decrease the interest rate. And this is done to address a situation of a crisis, to address a situation of slowdown. Okay, so a large quantitative easing is done for that purpose. So when government reverses its previous policy of quantitative easing and as a result the interest rate increases interest rate or bond yield increases then we call it tapering taper tantrum what is taper tantrum taper tantrum is 2013 situation after 2008 financial crisis USA followed massive quantitative easing something which ne which was never seen in history before and I mean after the Great Depression so in the previous 70 years 60 years we haven't seen such a response by USA. So there was so much increase in money supply. And as a result, interest rates were very, very low. Because interest rates in USA were very, very low, bond yield in USA were very, very low. A lot of money from US bond market, treasury bill market, and even stock markets to some extent was invested abroad because US market was giving low return, money was abroad. But in 2013, USA reversed the quantitative easing. USA reversed quantitative easing. So this is a standard policy of tapering. Okay. However, because of this, suddenly there was a mad rush throughout the world by investors. Okay. This resulted into a tantrum, a sudden tantrum or sudden erratic behavior by investors. because of which all the currencies in the world suddenly fell against US dollar okay so because of which what led to massive depreciation of major currencies in world including rupee this situation this event is known as the taper tantrum US government followed a traditional tapering policy a reversal of the quantitative easing which it did after 2008 finance. but as USA did it the response by the investors the response by the traders that was a kind of unproportionate that was very strange and suddenly we see that from everywhere money was coming to USA and as a result there was depreciation in the other currencies so how this term comes into Indian economic survey or our budgeting this term has come into our survey because our rupee had such a setback at that time that it was a very uncomfortable situation for us. The rupees value fell by almost 20-22% within 6 months. That was a crisis in BOP. Now what we are saying is that now USA once again had quantitative easing after the COVID situation in 2020. Since 2020 or from last 2 years USA has been following a easy monetary policy. 
and now USA is saying in the April this year, in the March this year, 2022, we are going to reverse, we are going to taper our interest rates or taper our market, bond yields, etc. So if USA is going to reverse such quantitative easing, then some people are saying this may lead to repeat of the crash that we had in 2013. So in that context, it is used in survey that this time we are prepared. In 2013, we didn't expect it or somehow we were not adequately prepared for that situation. But now we are monitoring it very strictly. RBI has a large reserve and <clears throat> RBI is prepared for a situation and RBI can release massive stock of Forex in order to prevent such situation from happening again. So this is the context. It, it, it is the context in which it is in survey. So now this should also be clear. So this is where we have spent maximum time the terms from this year. Now I will spend some time on the terms from the previous surveys. Let us look at our next job. So we have discussed these four. Next is economic recovery. V, W, U, etc. So, <coughs> the COVID situation in 2020 led to economic crash. But there was something unique to this crash. What, what happened, happened in 2020 was utilization of our capacity. because of lockdowns. Okay, because there were lockdown, because production was stopped, because people stopped going to office for certain period, <coughs> there was a big decrease in economic output. or GDP or production. It's the same thing. GDP is the sum total of the production in the country. Now, in most countries, this was a sudden and very sharp decrease. Okay. Some people called it this kind of a decline in some countries, absolutely sudden. Okay. So whatever, there was a sudden decrease in the economic output. This was natural. <coughs> okay, for example, your GDP is 3.2 trillion dollar or 3 trillion dollar, but suddenly it falls to 2.8 trillion dollar. <coughs> Let me make it again. Let us say India is following a trajectory around 3.1 trillion dollars. Okay, so we were following this path. Okay, so from three to three and one. This is the growth path that India is following. Okay, so India's growth. Now suddenly, because of the, as we see this situation, the economic which was nice increasing all along, suddenly decreases. So this is where it was. Let us. One trillion dollar, and now it's certainly okay. So, this is a big decrease in the output. Now, in this case of COVID, we expect a very fast recovery because our economic production capacity has not decreased. Try to understand. The decrease in capacity is one thing. If your capacity decreases, then it will take a long time to recover. For example, because of war, because of a natural calamity, if your production system itself getting destructed, then it will take years for you to come out of crisis. 
but if your economic output was affected only because of a lockdown only because of a certain situation then your capacity is not affected and since your capacity is not affected as soon as this situation is over the production will be back to where it was earlier so that is why we expect like there was sharp decrease similarly there will be sharp recovery so that is how we expect the growth trajectory to continue so it was following this recover and then it will this path again okay so there is a big dip in between but similar recovery also why do we expect this recovery i have already told you okay because our capacity our production capacity our factories our offices they are still intact some of them have shut down because of the distress related to the lockdowns and many companies could not handle the financial crisis associated but still by and large our production capacity is intact and now this year we have seen that as fast as our downfall was much better is our recovery now our production is already at the pre covid level and in most of the areas we are going to surpass our pre covid level so as much as we decline in one year we more than improve in the next year so there is no doubt there will be recovery but in the last year what we were debating now we know india's recovery is v shape okay if you look at the gdp charts also the recovery can be seen and it very much looks like a v shape now we can very safely call it india made a v shape recovery some people may call it u shape recovery but v or u really is not very much different from each other okay so u again a very sharp recovery and very sharp very sharp fall and very sharp recovery but what is the difference in u that the decline is for a very long time okay so that is not there the decline was not for a very long time as soon as we saw decline we also started to recover so but that depends upon interpretation because it depends for example if you look at this chart and you change the horizontal line for example instead of one month you make it over one week then this v itself will look like this okay v itself may look like this so, v or u is not fundamentally different from each other in both the cases sharp recovery after sharp fall what is a w shape recovery w is different v and u are not fundamentally different from each other what is w that first there is fall then there is recovery but this recovery is not complete before there is this recovery there is once again a fall and after that there is another recovery this is a w shape recovery so some people were arguing because of the repeated covid waves recovery can also be w shape okay so it falls it was improving it was recovering but immediately it falls again and is then improving once again so this is our w shape recovery so now you have understood the shapes india's recovery fortunately has not been w india's recovery has largely been v shape and now we can almost claim it okay so why there is recovery i have made it clear why we were absolutely sure that there will be recovery because our capacity was not affected what we were debating we were not debating whether there will be recovery we were debating what will be the shape of recovery how long recovery will take and sometimes how long recovery will take can create a difference between v and u okay in the v as soon as we fall immediately we recover in the u sometimes this is where we create a difference we fall but recovery takes some time we remain in this situation for some time and only after a certain period we start to recovery okay so this is the difference although fundamentally very similar we fall and then we rise in one single shot 
In W, the situation is different. We rise, we once again fall and then rise. So this is about the economic recovery. So again, an important term related to the COVID crisis and the ongoing situation. Now, some of the old, old terms, but still very much relevant. So next is the hand of trust. This is a very unique and a very special situation. I mean, a term that was used by economic survey. So what is a hand of trust? In order to understand hand of trust, I have to talk about invisible hand. And then economic survey term and that was Matsya Nyaya. So all of these are interrelated. Let us talk about it. Okay. So first of all, invisible hand, we should all be aware of it. That the theory by Adam Smith which is one of the oldest theory in economics argues that nobody need to monitor the markets market will work automatically people will create supply accordingly there will be demand and as there is demand people will next time supply so for example people are creating demand for tobacco automatically supply of tobacco will increase if more and people more and more people want tobacco what will happen the price of tobacco will increase because there are more buyers there is more demand if tobacco prices will rise more and more people will be interested in producing tobacco because tobacco now can give them profit at a higher price so this system automatically works this is invisible hand it works on the demand supply basis nobody has to monitor it it automatically works Everybody works for their self-interest, but if markets are allowed to function efficiently, markets can work without any problem. This was the Adam Smith argument. But what was argued by economic survey that invisible hand sometimes can create a situation of Matsya Nyai. What is Matsya Nyai? Large feeds on the small. Matse means fish and Nyai means justice. What is the system in the sea that a large creator creature eats a smaller creature? Large fish eats or feeds on the smaller fish. So there will be Matse Nyai if we leave market completely on their own. Large firms will take over small firms. And then there will be a problem because then ultimately some people will have too much economic power, too much concentration of power that they will be able to interfere. Then it will no longer be invisible hand. Then there will be interference because some people will be too big to control the markets. We do not want that situation. So government play an active role and provide a hand of trust. Hand of trust is required to ensure invisible hand is not controlled by few for their interest yes everybody will work for self-interest but we do not want few people to completely control that that is our issue with the unregulated market so what is hand of trust hand of trust comes from regulation To prevent Matsya Nyai okay? and this intervention by government acts as a hand of trust. So ultimately the hand 
than it actually okay is required is complementary okay that is another way of right is complementary is not enemy it is complementary to the invisible hand the hand of trust is complementary to the invisible hand so government has to provide justice government has to provide a good legal system where if there is any dispute people can get solution quickly so that is where we have gap we need to ensure that the hand of trust is firm is present and is seen by everyone so we need to strengthen our legal system as well we need to work on our regulatory system as well there is a need for us to improve on those parts so that was the hand of trust and this invisible hand and matse nyay argument the next point is creative destruction what is creative destruction can destruction be creative that is a very interesting point so this is a already well known theory okay and not exactly a theory but this is a very popular quote from a very popular book by joseph schumpeter you do not have to go back go back to reading joseph schumpeter we read joseph schumpeter in college and i remember it is a wonderful book okay on capitalism on socialism and the markets so what is creative destruction let's come to the point the schumpeter argued and now our economic survey let us discuss it in that context the economic survey argues that creative destruction is one of the most wonderful force that destruction will happen is inevitable destruction is inevitable old ideas will be replaced by new old ideas will be replaced by new old outdated technology will be replaced by latest technology okay so this is what we call creative destruction that destruction is happening we are destructing we are destroying the system but we are replacing it with a better system there is some creation this destruction is leading to creation creation of something better so this is a creative destruction and creative destruction is good for economy but but we need to work on certain aspects to ensure that the people who are getting destructed are not negatively affected okay the old technology the old ideas certain people will be or likely to be affected very badly by them we need to make sure such people are heavily rehabilitated and we need to make sure that these people are not very very badly affected so there is another term which is very strongly related to it and i will discuss it in this context only this is chakravyu challenge although i have written it here number 11 let us discuss it together so what is chakravyu challenge all of you must have heard of a book called mahabharat mahabharat is not just a book it's our heritage it's our cultural heritage it's as for some people it is our history for some people it is our greatest mythology nonetheless the objective is not a sermon on mahabharat the point is all of us at least know that there is something called mahabharat now some of you definitely would know certain important events of mahabharat one of the important event was the death of or the killing of abhimanyu 
abhimanyu was the son of arjun who was killed in the battle of mahabharat and why he was killed because he was caught in a chakravyu abhimanyu knew how to enter abhimanyu only had half knowledge he knew how to enter but he did not know how to exit so he entered chakravyu but he could not come out of chakravyu he died within the chakravyu the economic survey is arguing or has argued earlier that creative destruction is good but the problem is in india there is a chakravyu challenge this chakravyu challenge needs to be addressed so that we can truly benefit from creative destruction what is chakravyu challenge that in india over time we have brought lot of reforms to invite the companies to enter to make it easy to do business okay as our ease of doing business has improved we have had so many programs to improve startups to establish new businesses okay so make in india is promoting all of this startup india and then even in 1991 de licensing was aimed at this so for past 30 years what have, what we have been doing we have been solving this entry problem that how to make it easy to start a business so entry problem is solved we have become a abhimanyu who know how to enter but somehow we need to become a arjun who also know how to exit we do not want to die in this chakravyu so the problem is we have not brought enough reforms for the exit it is very very difficult in india to shut down a company you want to shut down a company immediately it will be in trouble the usual procedure of shutting down company you have to lay off employees you have to shut down that company sold that plant and you have to use that money to invest into new technology that is the usual mechanism okay so for example you was making uh, you were you uh, you had a factory of uh, compact disc cds cds were very popular a decade ago or two decades ago they were very very popular mode of storage okay so this compact disc somebody could easily have been uh, believing that this cds are going to last for next 50 years 60 years 20 years ago we could have thought okay but it changed very very quickly okay cds which were used for media storage largely and otherwise for data storage within a decade they went out from usage and instead pen drives or flash drives were increasingly being used now even pen drive or flash drives are getting out of usage because of the cloud computing and server storage so whatever is there the thing is technology changes let us say in 2000 i set up a factory to manufacture compact disc or cds dvds now by 2010 already i can see my sales are declining i am in distress this company cannot continue because the technology has changed people have stopped purchasing compact disc by 2005 6 it was clear that my business has hit the peak now every year sale is falling but i was still in profit by 2010 i'm already in losses now i have to shut down this factory so as soon as i want to shut down a factory first of all shutting down a factory is not easy process if you have labor above a certain number let us say above 100 above 200 in different states labor is a state subject that is why we do not have a fixed number here but let's say if you have more than 100 employees in your company then those employees are allowed to create union as per the laws in maximum number of states in india and once they create a labor union then they can get affiliation from the different labor department from state and it, if it is a affiliated labor union it can file a case against the company if it is trying to lay off more than 20% of the workers so as soon as a company wants to shut down a factory we will we see in india that labor union file a case against it sometimes the debates are settled outside labor unions are paid off money labor are given huge pay off checks sometimes settlement do not reach and sometimes these cases go on for decades companies are unable to shut down this is one problem in exit okay similarly there are other problems apart from labor laws there was no clear legal system earlier 
now we have created IBC insolvency and bankruptcy code but before that no clear system was there if your company is in distress is in problem and you want to declare bankruptcy or insolvency there was no clear mechanism for this so lack of legal clarity was another problem it is still a problem IBC has not completely solved the problem it is a good change but not a complete solution yet and the third thing is a social attitude the social attitude where failure is absolutely frowned upon you have a factory as long as you have a factory even if it is loss making you will have prestige in society great prestige in society but as soon as you shut down this factory even if it was loss making your prestige will greatly decline so sometimes people keep on running their loss making units just to maintain their social prestige this is also a big problem in India so all of this ultimately creates an exit problem where either companies do not shut down or are unable to shut down and this is the Chakravyu challenge that we have so we do not want to become Abhimanyu who dies in the Chakravyu we want to become Arjun who can enter as well as exit and that is only how companies can increase in value and companies can grow into big okay so because technology will change quickly how a company can survive that within time it is switching very quickly okay and that requires us to be very very flexible and that requires us to address this chakra view challenge then only creative destruction will be truly useful and transformative so this is the entire idea next term is also related to the scene so not exactly the next but another term which is related to these so I will discuss these before the very next term next term I will discuss is missing middle what is missing middle problem economic survey explained that Indian economy has a very bad missing middle problem what is missing middle all of us are know that there is a category of companies called MSME what is MSME micro small and medium enterprise missing middle problem is that bulk of our MSME more than 90 percent 95 percent MSME are micro or small okay in this category we do have very very few medium enterprises so the middle is missing from MSME this is the problem and why this middle is missing from the prop situation because if we look at the large companies in India most of these we will find they are either very very big business houses and running from a very long time so they have been large for a very long time or they are startups they have suddenly increased in value but very few companies in India have actually emerged from bottom that they were small then they emerged into middle position okay a medium company about two three thousand employees around hundred crore rupees of output this is a good medium sized company okay so the very few companies have become large from this small a small company becoming medium to big corporate house that is a good journey for a company and that is how an economy also grows unfortunately in India what we have that small companies remain small completely new companies enter into large companies category and middle is missing in between this is the problem we have a missing middle problem very few firms okay only 1% of our MSME little more than 1% of our MSME are middle, middle corporations rest are all micro and small so that means our companies are unable to grow over time and why they are unable to grow over time because of the chakra view challenge because they are unable to react to the technological changes they shut down as small 
or they remain in distress as the small company. So this is our problem. This is the missing middle problem. Okay, and this missing middle problem is costing us very badly because our small town economy, because our uh, rural economy, semi-rural economy, <coughs> that is very badly affected. The large companies, the big startups, they are not set up in rural areas. They are set up in big urban areas, urban centers, Bombay, Mumbai, I mean, or Bengaluru, Gurugaon, Gurugram now, etc. So, these are certain startup hubs, Bangalore being the topmost. So, bulk of our big companies are now generated in those cities. Unfortunately, our small town companies are not becoming big and that is has very badly tilted our economic system which is now very very metro dependent which is now very very dominated by certain cities and this is a problem the missing middle problem clear so in msme medium which we can also call middle that is missing In 15 minutes, 10 minutes okay so now this leads to another situation what is this another situation let us very quickly cover it infant and dwarf industry what is infant industry first of all what is infant infant is a small kid which is unable to tend to itself. Infant is a kid which can't even drink water itself, which can't even feed itself. So infant requires support. Not about industry, just infant. What is a dwarf? I will use a term which is not a very politically correct term today, but I have to use it because that is the only term we have in our language. The term in our colloquial language for dwarf is bona. Okay, vaman, bona. Basically, anyone who has not been able to grow, small in size, but not in capacity, not otherwise small. Okay, so those are dwarf. Dwarfs do not require support or require very less support. Do not require support. First of all, this is we need to understand. So economic survey introduced this term, infant industry has been a traditional term. It introduced dwarf industry as a new term. And it argued that our MSME must be classified as infant or dwarf. The benefits that we provide to small companies in India, MSME gets a lot of benefit. They come into priority sector lending. They get so many other advantages. Okay, they get many preferential treatment from government, many subsidies, etc. So, MS may get favorable treatment. However, now we need to stop this treatment for dwarf firms. Okay, stop favorable treatment for dwarf firms. This is the argument by economic survey. If we want to best utilize our resources, then stop this treatment for dwarf firms. Do not give benefits to all MSME. Give benefits to MSME which are infant firms which have been established in last 10 years, not other companies. Let us say there is a company which has been there for last 40 years. 40 years ago its output was 2 lakh rupees per annum this now its output is let us say 80 lakh rupees per annum if you settle for inflation its output is constant it has not been able to register any kind of growth so this company is not going to grow even if you give it benefit for another 100 years it is a wastage to spend resources on dwarfs okay wastage to 
spend resources on dwarfs. So stop subsidy for old firms which have not been able to grow. Give it or restrict it to the new companies. That is the idea. So companies which unable to grow over time, they are called dwarf firms. And we have seen in the previous argument or discussion that in our MSME, most of the companies are dwarf. They have not been able to grow significantly. Very few small companies became medium. Very few micro became small. So this is what remains a big problem in India. Transformation is not happening. Yes, we have large number of big companies, but most of those companies are now coming from startups or they are launched by big business houses. Yes, there are companies which are becoming large from medium and small also, but their number is very small given the size of our economy. That was the precise point. Last year we had 42 startups or 43 startups which had reached a valuation of over billion dollars. Okay. In contrast, if you look at the traditional companies which are more than 10 years old and which reached the valuation of 1 billion dollar, there were hardly two or three. This is the difference why I was talking about. Okay, so this infant and dwarf industry, Chakravyu challenge, missing middle, everything is discussed from here. Now let us very quickly discuss the remaining terms, not very very difficult. In fact, these are relatively well known terms. Pro-market and cronyism. Not and or cronyism. So economic survey at certain point of time also wanted to clear this term that what do we mean by pro-market? Because somehow in Indian polity, pro-market has become a bad term that this government is very pro-market, this government is very pro-business, suit boot ki sarkar. This is a jibe against the government. This is used against the government. Why? This is what economic survey tried to explain. Pro-market is not bad. Pro-market is good. Pro-market is a good thing. Cronyism is bad. Cronyism, when you favor some of your business houses, some of your friends and you give them special benefits and they become big, that is cronyism. But pro-market is different. Pro-market is when you set a hand of trust. Okay, you do not interfere in market. You support the market. You create a hand of trust. We have already discussed what is hand of trust. So I do not have to explain it again. What is pro-market? What is pro-market is that government intervenes in the market but to regulate that nobody unnecessarily controls the market. When we say there should not be market interference, this means from both sides, neither by government nor from private player. But private player automatically, if they have ability, they will try to influence market. If I am a very big company, I will to take over all the small companies and kill the competition. Okay, for in order to stop this, government has created Competition Commission of India. Now, Competition Commission of India intervenes in such cases. So, this is the point. Clear? So, the Pro-market itself is not bad because government is intervening in order to stop this concentration of power at one place. So that private players are also unable to badly interfere. They small interference, people becoming medium, people becoming influential, that is okay up to certain limit. Okay, but too much of it is bad. So government may have to intervene at certain situation. So, pro-market is not bad. Pro-market means we are ensuring that demand and supply are freely able to interact. Customers and buyers, they are freely able to interact. Pro-market basically means that we are ensuring that there is competition, there is still freedom of entry. No big company is following anti-competitive policies. So, that is pro-market.
नेक्स्ट इज वर्चुअल और वर्चुअस और विशेष साइकिल विशेष साइकिल इज ऑलरेडी ए वेरी वेल नोन टर्म वट इज विशेष साइकिल वेन यू आर कॉट इन ए साइकिल एंड इट्स वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू कम आउट ऑफ इट फॉर एग्जाम्पल वन कॉन्सिक्वेंस लीड्स टू अनदर दिस लीड्स टू अनदर बैड कॉन्सिक्वेंस एंड दिस अगेन री एनफोर्स इज द ओरिजिनल कंडीशन वी कैन डिस्कस इट विद एग्जाम्पल लेट एस ए पॉवर्टी लो इनकम बिकॉज ऑफ लो इनकम लो डिमांड बिकॉज पीपल क्रिएट लो डिमांड प्राइवेट सेक्टर इज नॉट इंटरेस्टेड और देर इज नो इन्वेस्टमेंट वाई ए कंपनी इन्वेस्ट बिकॉज द कंपनी फील्स दैट इट कैन मेक मोर प्रॉफिट इन फ्यूचर बिकॉज इट फील्स इट्स वट एवर इट इज प्रोड्यूसिंग राइट नाउ दैट विल नॉट बी एडिकेट टू मीट डिमांड वी नीड टू इंक्रीज सप्लाई सो टू इंक्रीज द सप्लाई एनी कंपनी इन्वेस्ट and why it will increase supply only when demand is increasing if demand is not increasing why a company will try to increase supply no it will not so low demand means low investment this means low growth without investment growth can't happen and with low growth low income will still remain there so this is a vicious cycle we have to break it from outside okay so government may intervene and invest big so that we break this cycle here this investment leads to higher growth higher income higher demand and then this cycle turns so similarly we have a virtuous cycle virtuous cycle is very similar now it is other way round one good thing leads to another good things leads to another and this reinforces the original situation so let us say high income or uh, okay not high income let us say high growth Okay, let us say country is experiencing high growth rate. Because of high growth rate, there will be increase in income. Because of increase in income, increase in demand. Increase in demand will encourage producers to invest more. increase in investment will further increase the growth rate so it will create a positivity loop where each cycle will boost the growth so this is a virtuous cycle so opposite can also happen not only vicious cycle but virtuous cycles are possible now economic survey tried to explain in which context the economic survey used it the economic survey said that expecting 9% growth from indian economy in the present context is very difficult because 9% growth did not happen suddenly it was the result of a very long virtuous cycle from 2001 or from 1999 to 2007 we had a long virtuous cycle okay and because of this virtuous cycle eventually every year you see our growth rate was increasing from 7% from 6.5% to 7% from 7 to 8 8 to 8.5 then ultimately 9 because every year growth was boosting itself so that is a virtuous cycle achieving 8 or 9% growth without a virtuous cycle is very difficult you cannot suddenly create that high growth china also had a virtuous cycle when it was having 10% growth you cannot do it suddenly so that is the broader idea clear so you cannot suddenly today create 8% growth or there should be a background some reason for that otherwise typical growth would be around the base level which is around 6.57 and today we cannot even expect that kind of a virtuous cycle also so around 2019 it was argued because at that time world was unipolar ussr declined in 1990s and china was largely abiding 
with the international agreements and world in a way was a very different kind of a place where globalization was penetrating more and more the, there was a certain world order which was becoming more successful trade was increasing very rapidly everywhere and growth was not only in india growth was everywhere because everybody was very hopeful okay and in this situation for a country to grow is not very very difficult automatically if international economies or overall the global economy is increasing automatically your own global growth rate increases so at that time there was a sort of virtuous cycle not only in india but world over but right now we have a vicious cycle now we are in deglobalizing trend brexit has happened the china america war is imminent the trade wars etc not the physical war but even physical war cannot be ruled out and increasingly there is more and more tension with each passing day and china is also increasingly belligerent after the creation of quad and other groups china believe usa is trying to encircle china and trying to provoke it so basically the situation is bad okay there is uh, unease there is lack of peace world over there are different revolts wars going on ukraine situation is bad and it is not bad from today from 2014 the ukraine situation is bad okay middle east is burning for last almost a decade that arab spring which from which people hoped whatever will happen has proved to be disastrous for entire middle east okay or west asia except one or two countries it did not lead to positive conclusion rather it led to destruction the fall of qatafi fall of some other leaders who were controlling those territories they were doing a great job in stabilizing those regions but now there is absolute lack of stability in all those countries any anyway, the point should be clear that the world today is very very different and to have a high growth rate today is more difficult we are not saying impossible but more difficult than earlier so this in this context we use the virtuous and vicious cycle one more term or two more term pro cyclical counter cyclical very easy and will not take more than 2 minutes here what is pro cyclical when economy itself is going in a positive loop when things are good when business private sector is already encouraged and investments are increasing growth is increasing let us say we are in a positive business cycle a good business cycle boom period then do not do any such thing which can reverse this rather take a pro cyclical approach you should try to boost this as much as possible okay so you should not become over excited also and you should not try to restrict that also that is a pro cyclical policy so for example when private sector demand for investment is already high government should try to restrict its borrowing so that there is no crowding out crowding out is a very popular term which is in the common terms on which we will have another session so you will soon see another session on common terminology so i will cover this there so what is pro cyclical when there is a positive business cycle good business cycle private sector itself is very encouraged to make investment government should not try to interfere too much and whatever it should it can do it should provide them positive feedback it should give them support it should not try to interfere a lot in that situation that itself is a pro cyclical policy you support you create conditions for that to grow further okay so if private sector is doing well you invest in infrastructure but do not borrow too much otherwise interest rates will increase if private sector is in investing try opt for quantitative easing increase money supply cut interest rate private sector will be further encouraged these are some pro cyclical policies and what are counter cyclical counter cyclical what we are doing at present because of covid there was decrease in demand when there was decrease in private sector demand government increased its demand for different things for example steel for example cement for example concrete etc 
so government is investing big time in public sector projects in infrastructure and by that government increased its demand for example we have data now and uh, the private sector consumption for example fell from 100 to 90 meanwhile the government increased from 100 to 107 to offset it so government is trying to cover up for the decrease in demand by private sector and today government demand has further increased to 111 if we take 100 as the base while private sector demand is also now rebounding close to 96-97 okay so this is our consumption level you can check economic survey for this this gives you the exact data here if we take 2019 data to be 100 then there was almost 10% decline, 9% decline in private sector consumption and almost 7-8% increase in government's, government's consumption. While private sector cut down activity, government enhanced its activity. We started making more and more roads. We increased our speeds of making, speed of making road. When there was lockdown, at the same time we were making public projects at record speed. So this is something government was doing. This is a counter cyclical. We are in a bad business cycle, but government is trying to counter it. The negative business cycle must be countered, a positive business cycle must be supported. So this is the broader idea. And the next is RIRI. Rational Investor rating index okay. any rational investor any person who wants to take a decision to put his money in any economy on what basis investor will take decision so economic survey argued that it is on the basis of risk and rewards the reward is the growth or return this depends upon the growth rate if you want to put your money into any economy, you will put it into the faster growing economy rather than slow economies. At the same time, you will also try to balance the risk. Okay, So everyone who tries to invest looks at the growth, looks at the risk. Okay, So the rewards can be written as the return and this is the growth. So any economies attractiveness to investors can be measured by this term was given by economic survey by its growth rate plus its risk factors so economic survey used the term macroeconomic vulnerability macroeconomic vulnerability to define the risk and what are these risk these were defined as three broader indicators the fiscal deficit, the current account deficit and the inflation. These are our three most important macroeconomic indicators. These should be as low as possible. Risk should be low, reward should be higher. Okay, so macroeconomic vulnerability, vulnerability should be low and growth should be higher if any economy can achieve low vulnerability with high growth it will get more and more foreign capital this is the idea so three years ago India surpassed China to become the highest FDI receiving country this has happened last year also by the way so since we received highest FDI in the world economic survey explained this development by this that our macroeconomic vulnerability was low our fiscal deficit was relatively low, our current account deficit was under control, our inflation was also very low at that time. That is why our macroeconomic vulnerability was low whereas our growth rate was still very decent. A combination of this ensured that our RIRI was good and hence we were attracting lot of investments. So that was the idea behind RIRI. This was a very special term given by economic survey. With this we have completed the special and the unique terms in the survey. 
we will have another session where we will discuss the common terms and after that we will have more sessions where we will discuss the economic survey the state of the economy the trade the commerce okay and all of this one by one so let's end, let us end this session and i hope this session has helped you to understand these special terminologies thank you